Good evening. I want to start off always by thanking uh, the elders. They set aside a time each month for uh, other members to be able to present sermons, and it's always nice uh, to be able to hear that uh, from other members. Um, uh, and it's always good for me, uh, and I'm sure uh, all the men would echo this, that any time that you uh, study and prepare a sermon, you always get to learn a lot, and usually you end up uh, picking something that you want to learn more about, and then you just get to tell everybody else about it, uh, which is always really nice. Um, uh, you don't necessarily just say, like, I think people should get to hear about this. You just you pick something you like, and then you just get to spread that message, and of course, uh, we have tons of material. Um, so always thankful uh, for that, as well as for everyone who is here this evening. Uh, and uh, we've got just a few passages we'll look at tonight and um, try and see if we can uh, answer a question uh, that I have come across uh, just in my life. Um, uh, I hear, you know, you hear different uh, beliefs, interpretations of scripture, um, uh, different religious backgrounds, uh, like all the, quote, facets of Christianity, as well as just other religious backgrounds in general. Um, uh, When I was at my house uh, a week or two ago, I talked with some men uh, who were from the Mormon church. Uh, It's always good uh, whenever you can talk to somebody who has different beliefs than you, try and show them why you believe uh, what the Bible says. Uh, You and I talked about that the other day. Um, I've listened to like, uh, you know, videos and like Q and A's from different speakers and different things. Uh, from like the background of Islam, uh, and that was actually something that prompted uh, my study tonight and the message I'm going to bring to you guys. Um, But anything that uh, helps you think about your faith, that makes you uh, reaffirm or, you know, study more uh, is always going to be strengthening. Um, Help confirm what you understand. When I met Jamie and we started dating, you know, she said, why do you do it this way? Why do you do this? What's, what about this? And it was no longer just, well, we just do it. Like I had to really dig and know the scriptures and know why the reason we do the things that we do, uh, that we might be different than the way other people practice something uh, and how we try and make sure we have a book, chapter, and verse for the things that we believe, the things that we teach, the things that we practice. Um, So I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, This is my understanding from some of these different things that I've read and seen. Uh, The Islam faith, as most people know, believe that Jesus was a prophet, but not that he was the literal son of God. Um, Jesus is actually mentioned in the Quran more times than the prophet Muhammad, who is said to be the inspiration or the writer, air quotes, of the Quran. and they're, one of their big arguments for this, uh, when they, they uh, actually will quote Bible scripture, is that Jesus himself never says that he is the Son of God. His followers say that. Uh, and Jesus is always trying to convince or uh, help explain to his followers that he is not the true Son of God, the way that um, really the whole foundation of our faith is based in. And... Um, I've heard, you know, several arguments uh, from the, you know, those uh, Islam teaching um, believers that that's, uh, that's their big stance is Jesus never says it. It's only his followers who are misinformed or don't understand, and they're the ones who say it. Um, so I'd like to look at a few passages tonight, and we will try and answer this question. Uh, if Jesus really is the Son of God. So the first one is John chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 22, and we'll read 22 through 31 is the context I want to look at here. Um, And I do want to mention that I'm going to try and stick in the Gospels because that is uh, dealing with direct interactions with Jesus. Uh, We can go to tons of different places. We could spend 10 lessons talking about uh, Jesus being our our Savior, the Son of God. But I'm going to try and focus on uh, passages that are in the Gospels for the purpose of this lesson. So we'll start in verse 22, chapter 10, uh, the book of John. Uh, So at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. If you remember on Wednesday, we talked about the colonnade of Solomon, so everybody in the adult class should have a uh, very good understanding of where that was. Uh, So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. 
but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Uh, and then it says, there, verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. So uh, let's dive in a little bit more detail about this passage. Uh, so verse 24, uh, the Jews say, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? Uh, if you are the Christ, tell us. Uh, so they, they have come to him asking this question, which means that they, they have at least heard or maybe think that he is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, and Jesus' response is that, I told you and you didn't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Uh, Jesus was a unique man on this earth. He performed uh, countless miracles. Um, we, we don't have anywhere near the amount of them that are, are recorded for us as what was actually done. Um, and that's something that's very unique to Jesus. Uh, it was different than anyone else before him, anyone else that came after him. Uh, the amount of times we can look up healings and feeding people and, uh, you know, power over nature. It's just the, the power of Jesus that we see in scripture is just amazing. And we can't, we can't deny that he came here with power that nobody else had. Uh, verse 26, uh, it says, uh, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Uh, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Um, he says, my sheep believe me and they know my works and they will not perish. Uh, they have the protection of the Father. That's what we see in verse 29. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So he's basically telling them, like, if you understood, if you believed, if you saw my works, you, would, you know who I am. You understand where I am from. Uh, and then verse 30, I and the Father are one. He puts himself equal to God. Uh, and then we see verse 31, Jew, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And uh, according to my, uh, the way my Bible reads, that's the first, pay, or the first sentence in the next paragraph. I like to pull it out here because it says that at this point, they picked up stones to stone him. The punishment for blasphemy was stoning, and they understood whether or not he said those specific literal words, I am the Son of God. They understood through his statements here, these dozen verses or so, that that's the claim that he is making. He is saying, I come with power that you have never seen. I come from my Father who sent me. So whether they believed him or not, they understood he was claiming who he was uh, and that they, they, they weren't confused. They didn't say like, let's, let's, let's talk some more. Let's figure this out. They understood that his claim was that he was the Christ. Uh, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 16. This will be our next passage. Matthew chapter 16, we'll be starting in verse 13. This was our uh, scripture reading that Hunter read this evening. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. Uh, now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I, the Son of Man, do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Flesh, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I love this passage. Um, Peter is one of the great Bible characters. Uh, he is... He's always, he has so much zeal for Christ. Every time Christ comes up with something, he's, he's the one. He get, he's the one who gets out of the boat when Christ is walking on water. Um, he, he's always the, he's the really gung-ho one. He speaks without thinking sometimes. Um, but he, he's, he's, just, he's always on fire for, 
for God. And so I love the fact, like, this is just another one of those examples where Peter is the one who, who comes up and speaks and says something. Uh, but he says, uh, verse 13, who do people say that I am? Uh, and then verse 14, they get, you know, various answers. John the Baptist, Elijah, a prophet. And then he says, okay, the people think, people have some different opinions. Who do you, my closest followers, my, my disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then verse 17, Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. If this were one of those times where Jesus needed to correct his disciples, that they, did, they weren't getting it, you know, we see, I, I liken that argument to the disciples always not quite understanding the argument of the physical kingdom versus the spiritual kingdom and the struggle that Jesus has trying to help them understand that. If, if this was a similar argument, Jesus is trying to help them understand, I'm not the son. Like, I'm just, I'm just, I'm a good guy, but I'm not the son. This is the chance for him to say, no, you got it wrong. That's not what he says. It, he, he, this, is his, this is his moment to clear up all the questions. And he says, verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then verse 18 is another really cool passage. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, I feel like I've probably said this in class, or I may have said it in another sermon. I love this passage. Um, Peter is the word petros, which means a stone or a small, a small rock, something that a man can throw. So like, you know, picture yourself and, you know, at most you're talking about like a softball size, you know, something that can be picked up and thrown. And then he says, on this rock, the word rock is petra, which is, they're very close, petros and petra. The word rock here is petra, meaning a mass of connected rock or a boulder such as a projecting cliff. So in the original language, there's a big contrast here between the mountain of his words, his confession, you are the Christ, the son of God, and the little pebble that made the statement. Jesus is saying your words, your confession, your sentence, you are the Christ, the son of God is so much more greater than anything that you, little Peter, do or say. And that's the foundation of the church. This confession is what the church is built on. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He lived a perfect life. He became the sacrifice for us, for our sins, so that we can have a chance in heaven with him. I love this passage, and it's one of those cool things that you get to learn uh, when you look at the original language. <clears throat> so then, six days later, we jump over to chapter 17. Uh, chapter 17, starting in verse 1, I'll we'll read through the first eight verses. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So I like this passage because, as I said, um, Islam says that uh, Jesus never, quote, like, ever says it. Uh, he only, you know, he's always trying to argue with his disciples against that stance that he is the son of God. 
Another thing that uh, the Muslim faith believes is that the Bible is a collection of words written by men, but the Quran is the actual words of God. Um, it's really funny because if you look at the origins of both of them, they're both written by men, but they put a lot of, they for some reason have a lot of stake in that while the Bible is a book written about or of men by men who are fallible, the Quran is written down somehow differently by men and therefore the word of God. The, the argument doesn't really hold up, but that's, that's, that's a big stance that they have is the Quran is is the literal words of God. Uh, and so I like this passage because we get the words of God in this passage. Uh, so verse 1, Peter, James, and John go up on a mountain with Jesus. And then it says he's transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes were as white as the light. And then uh, verse 3, others appear. We get Moses and Elijah, and there's there's Peter again. I love I love Peter. He's always he's always there, and he says, "Let's be th build three shelters or three tents for these three amazing figures that we have here." Uh, you know, if we go back uh, in our Bible history, uh, you know, Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind. He didn't die. He had you know many great things that he did that we have recorded for us in Scripture. Uh, Moses, you know, he went up uh, on the mountain, got the Ten Commandments, brought the law to the Israelites, led them out of Egypt uh, to the Promised Land. Um, these are two amazing figures in Bible history and Scripture. And Peter, in his mind, rightly says, let's honor all of these people and let, like, let's build something here. And recognize that we have these three key figures. He, he says, he's not discounting Jesus, but he's saying these, there are these other two. Like, let's do something for everybody. And then verse 5. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came from the cloud and said, this is my beloved son. So God interrupts him. While Peter's trying to say... Like, look, let's, let's make this work. Like, this is so great. Let's do this thing for everybody. God interrupts him and says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. It's, three, it's a three-word phrase, and I think it's incredibly powerful. He doesn't say, Listen to him until the next guy comes. Listen to him because... He's right for now. He says, listen to him. This, this, is a, this is one of those big contrasts we have between Jesus being so different and unique and important in our teachings over any other Bible character that we see. Um, uh, some people say, uh, you know, if we go back to the passage in chapter 16, some people think that Elijah's coming back. And I think, I don't know that it's necessarily like a, a coincidence that Elijah appears here. This would be you know, another chance to say, look, yes, Elijah, he is the one that's going to come back. Let's talk about him. But he doesn't say that. He says, don't pay attention to these two people because the most important thing is my son. Listen to him. Not some, not some man on earth that I'll continue to speak through until, until the world ends. Not some future prophet. Hear him. So God says this in Matthew 17, verse 5. Uh, I won't go back to the whole context, but Matthew 3, 17 is where uh, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. And we have that same statement. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So if we go back to that, that thought process that the uh, Islam faith has, that we need to listen to the words of God and not the words of man, those were the words of God. This is my beloved son. Again, we have, that, we have that being a very unique thing in scripture. We don't see that with a lot of other, uh, a lot, like any other, any other Bible figures, uh, how unique Jesus is. Um, 
So I want to spend the next 45 minutes, I'm kidding. We could go on with this for a long time. Um, uh, John 1 uh, is, uh, talks about John the Baptist. Uh, I don't want to go into that passage, but of course that's a wonderful passage that talks about Jesus being with God from the beginning, and then John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus, the Christ. Um, Matthew 8 talks about demons believing and identifying Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, Luke 1, we have Gabriel talking to Mary, telling her that she will give birth to the Son of God, Jesus. Um, we have hundreds of Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in Jesus. There's an abundance of evidence that points to Jesus being the unique figure in, in all of Scripture that everything builds towards, that everything culminates in and then everything flows out of as we get past Jesus' death on the cross. To say that everything points to him only to then get somewhere else just doesn't, doesn't make sense with Scripture. You can't say we're, everything points here until we get a few more hundred years down the road and somebody else comes along. We don't point somewhere and then audible our plan later because we because everything else got changed scripture is true and faithful and i think we have plenty of evidence to say that we we know that jesus was the son of god that he was a unique character uh in our in our history that is unlike any other jesus was the son of god he was both man and god he lived a perfect life tempted as we are without sin which brings me to a simple invitation. Uh, as this is a very short argument. There's, like I said, we go through a lot of other things, but Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus did come down onto this earth to live as a man, to be tempted as we are, to not sin, to be the sacrifice for our sins. Uh, I hope that if you haven't uh, obeyed the gospel that you have heard this word uh, that was presented here. Uh, hope this convicted you if you were uncertain. Uh, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, you need to believe that Jesus is the son of God as we have talked about tonight, that he was crucified on the cross for our sins. Uh, John eight twenty four says, unless you believe that I am he, uh, that is that I am sent down as the son of God uh, from heaven, you will die in your sins. Uh, you can repent and turn from the life that you live now, the life of sin. Uh, Luke 13, 3 says, repent or you will perish. Uh, if you reference back to John's sermon this morning, the first about five minutes, John did a wonderful job talking about, uh, talking about that point of turning your life to God means turning your life away from sin. Um, and it was really cool that he just kept on quoting 1 John. That whole book is, is all about turning your life towards God, turning your life away from sin, changing how you live your life. Uh, how that being born again requires change. You can't be born again if you're going to keep living the same way. Uh, you confess Jesus is the Christ, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You must believe in that confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, just like Peter did in Matthew chapter 16. You have to follow his word, be baptized. First Peter 3.21, there's an antitype which now saves us, which is baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And of course, baptism isn't the end. Now, which goes back to what First John says. You must be born again. You have to turn from sin. You have to continue living faithfully as Roman, or Revelations 2.10. Be thou faithful unto, the get, unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. If you have been baptized into, his, uh, into this church, if you have been baptized into the church that Jesus established, uh, that was established on Acts 2, but you have fallen away, uh, we are not perfect. We can fall away. We have free will that allows us to make our own choices. But God is long-suffering 
and allows us to be able to turn back to him. If you have fallen away, you need the prayers of the congregation. If you would like to enter into a relationship with God, be baptized into Jesus' death, and raised to walk in newness of life, whatever your need might be, please come forward as we stand and as we sing the song.